Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We are your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today we're excited because we're in the fourth part of our series on motivated sellers. But before we start, I've been liking to do this little theme where I kind of quiz you a little bit on something from the 80s since we are Gen Xers and a lot of our followers and fans are Gen Xers. I have kind of a lay down today. It's pretty easy. All right. But Let's I think do it. I'm li- ready. The listeners will know what this is. So hopefully you can hear. This is the... Uh, comes from a movie so let's discuss what movie it is in just a minute so let's play this clip anderson here bueller (laughs) bueller 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 um he's sick (laughs) well that's easy then the the word is in the title that's ferris bueller's day off what a great movie right it was yes i do i do love all those 80s movies you know my friends make fun of me because every time i i'm uh they'll ask like you know you know you see me watching movies over and over again sometimes especially the movies where the days repeat i don't know what it is with you that likes uh groundhog day and then the edge of tomorrow the day literally repeats over and over and over throughout the movie and those are probably those are the top movies. two movies that you watch on reruns. I don't get it. I like having those movies I can watch and not think about anything. It seems like stuff like Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Breakfast Club and Can't Buy Me Love and all those great movies from the 80s. I don't ever seem to watch the whole thing. I always seem to like yeah. catch a, a mid, something in the middle and then I watch it from there. But yeah, I don't know what it's about movies. I like to watch older movies and I just it just sort of takes me back to that time and makes me laugh. And I'm amazed by how old some of the people from those movies are now. <laughs> <laughs> Why does that surprise you? I mean, you see them on the on the big screen, you see them on your TV now, and then you watch, you're like, God, am I- They got old. Do I look am that I old? Am I that old? <laughs> yeah, do I look that old to somebody else? And I walk by a mirror and I see exactly what I look like and go, man, oh man, how did that happen? So crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, I love talking about our Gen X stuff. Anything exciting happen in our lives these days? As you said that though, I was thinking about that cute girl that- um, does the the guy from the 80s that did the songs and she does the um boom chicka uh uh what's that you know what i'm talking about oh, she's adorable the girl on tiktok yes oh the girl on tiktok that does, uh, her, her dad her dad was uh nothing's gonna change my love for you yeah i don't know by now and she's made a whole she's got like six hundred thousand followers off of an 80s song i said a boom chicka boom boom chicka yeah. boom yeah and she's yeah all all her daddy's beat her dad he was an international star yeah like he had all kinds of awards for like one he was a one hit wonder really he had a couple couple hits and that was about it so yeah that was yeah yeah funny. that's funny when our kids start getting on that you play that video and then they'll start going boom chicka boom I how said do you boom chicka boom how do you not love movies like that that have stood the test of time that our kids love like our kids yeah, they're watch like that timeless they, yeah our kids watch coming go, of age and our kids watch that and go this is great yeah i don't know watch movies from the 50s and go man that was great what you guys watch and i i doubt movies from today will be remembered like the movies in the 80s yeah i really doubt many. no there's probably a few but not they're many. too busy being woke and having agendas and just they just weren't yeah. having fun like just be kids and have fun they're all trying to they're all trying to outdo each other by with all that crap and it's just yeah. like man oh man can you just please get back to making yeah, stop fun? Stop with all the agendas and just make yeah, just make clean movies. Fun. Yeah. yeah, just make movies. Yeah, Don't worry about who's funny. in it and all and the have stuff actual they humor. do. Oh man, <laughs> crazy! But all right, listen, let's jump into this episode because there's a lot of great things to go over that I want to make sure that we cover. And you know, we talk a lot about Gen X, and I I think it's important to remember that what we talk about here a lot in our podcast is about how Gen Xers can really you know catch up on retirement. The average, I looked at the other day, the average Gen Xer has about $100,000 saved towards retirement. Yeah. So if you're a Gen Xer listening to this, you have to ask yourself, how much do you have saved? Is it more or is it less than that? Yeah. Because what you'll also learn is that if you don't have a couple million dollars set aside, that you don't have enough. Right. And I hate to say that. Because you have to dip into your principal instead of living off of the interest. That's 100% correct. People are like, I need this money to retire. But the problem is we're Gen Xers. We are tough and we're living longer. We're living longer and living longer costs money. Let's be honest. We are tough. I mean, Mm -hmm. we we will live longer. Most of us, I think, will live longer. Right now, the average is like 70 something years old, but that's 76 years old for a man. But, and for a woman, it's probably a little higher, but that's taking into account people that die very young. That's, That's the whole spectrum. I would love to see a stat like when you get to the age of 50 or 60, from then on, how much, how long do they live? Yeah, that'd be interesting. Because I'd like to see what the real average, because I think, I think you'd find we're living longer. My dad was 86 when he passed. My mom's 87 now and still kicking, still doing her thing. And yeah. a lot of my 
friend's parents are in their 80s. And so we're living a lot longer than that average life. And that's that generation. Yep. Our generation will live longer. And if you think you're going to have a million bucks set aside and you're just going to pick away at that, like I'm going to have some some interest coming in, I'm going to pick away, I'm going to pick away at my principal. The problem is you're out of money. And then if you're 90 years old and you've got six more years left in you, what do you do? Right. Live broke, live, 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 in, a, live in a home. Yeah. The state's not going to take care of it. Social no. Security, I just saw a report today, Social Security, it's going to go bankrupt, they said. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised. They're, they're going to be able to pay like 70, 70 cents in the dollar out what they're expecting now and 50 cents in some cases. And I have to, I'll have to do a separate podcast and talk about that. But I just kind of quickly saw the article. I've been thinking that's going to happen for years. And so Gen Xers are going to be out of money. And, I, and Gen, that's, who, that's, who I'm, that's who we are. So that's who I'm talking to right now is Gen Xers. And we don't want to put that burden on our kids. No, I don't. And so by buying real estate, you can completely pad your retirement. Yeah. And also have income that comes in from it and tax deductions and all the benefits that go along with it without doing all the work yourself right. or without risking a lot of your capital. So that's why we right. do all this. That's why we talk about it. Um, be sure that we, we just recently did a, a Gen X gut check episode. Yeah, that was fun. And it dove into all these details. So if you haven't seen that, please go check out the Gen X gut check episode. Yeah. And if you're if you're living your life kind of um, sweeping this under the rug. That's not the smartest way to go forward. You know, you, you need that gut check. You need to see where you're at and see if you need to make adjustments along the way. You know, making another reference to the 80s, I was a huge Cheers fan. Did you watch Cheers growing up? I love Cheers. You did? I love Cheers. So Sam Malone, I Every just, Thursday night, I think. Yes, Thursday yeah. night. Yeah, nine o'clock. It was fantastic. And I can't I, believe I remember that, but. Yes, yeah, no, that was great. Every we, Thursday it, night. Because in our generation, it, it was an event. Yeah, there were, had, you, there were no things on demand. You had to like either set your correct. DVR. Or your no, VHS tapes. There was no DVR. No, v VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, there was just, no DVR. No, VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you had to you had to go. So it was an event. So you're yeah. right. So we, Cosby Show was, I think, on at 8 o'clock. And then something, like Different World came on or something like that. And then then Cheers came on. Yeah. And I forgot what came on after Cheers, but it didn't really matter. But because Cheers was just the, that was the bomb yeah, back then. Yeah, that was then. awesome. And so Sam Malone, who was the womanizer, the ex-ball player, the owner of the bar, I love Sam Malone, fantastic, but he had the very simple way of looking at life. And it's a lot of the ways that, that uh, some of my, my former family, my, my, my uh, first wife's family, they used to, I used to joke and say, you guys operate like Sam Malone. And he used to say, well, just do what I do. Ignore the problem. It'll go it'll away. Go away. <laughs> and it doesn't go away. In this, in this case, you cannot yeah. ignore the problem. It will not go away because there will, there will be a, a day of reckoning when you open your eyes and say, I can't work anymore. I'm out of time. And I've got to take care of myself. How am I going to do this? Right. And so you don't want to do that now. So that's why we push so hard for Gen Xers to really, you know, let's get our head of our butts. Let's yeah. be that tough generation and just, just take the next few years and completely pad your retirement. Yeah. Like completely pad it and, you know, follow us. And again, I mean, go, you might think it's hopeless, but it's not if you take the right steps. Yeah. Go follow our episodes and, and learn why compound interest doesn't work for you, yeah. why, why you're out of time for compound interest and learn all that stuff. So, so let's dive into the last three motivated yep. sellers. And again, from motivated sellers, you can turn that into money by turning into either a wholesale deal, a flip or rentals. And yep. we think rentals is the way to wealth. But if you need, if you need to make cash now, you can certainly turn these into well, and, to there, a lot and of money. there's a way to do both too. For sure. Yeah. Let's dive into death. How motivational death, but it's a sad part of life. It happens all the time. And people pass away. And when they do, many times there's a piece of real estate that has to be dealt with and they don't know what to do in the house yep. is many times not in great condition. Yeah, honestly, this is probably the number one uh, source of houses that we buy because people inherit them and they, you know, a lot of the kids have houses of their own, so they don't need another one. This goes right along with people say there's no inventory now. There's no inventory. There's, people aren't selling their house. I'm like, but people are passing. People don't stop dying. No, I hate to say it, it. People don't stop dying. No matter what the economy is doing, yep. they don't stop dying. Right. We, none of us, they, not one of us getting out of here alive. Right. So someday our house will be somebody else's house. Right. And so keep in mind, you just have to get there before everybody else does. Right. That's be, the secret. Be the solution so, to their problem. Yeah. So be the solution to their problem. Yeah. I remember that one house that we bought in Rotterdam and um, that, that narrows it down, doesn't it? Yeah, we've, uh, <laughs> we've done like 300 in that town, literally. I forget the name of the street, but the people lived, I think, in California. There were a bunch of siblings that owned it, and they, they didn't want to- Is this the house with the cash? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. They, they didn't want to fly back, and I think they flew back and like took what they wanted out of the house, and, and yep. they just then wanted to sell it. We bought the house, and it was full, because what we do is we tell people, 
take what you want and leave the rest. Right. And we'll take care of it. You don't have to worry about cleaning it out. If there's furniture in it, we'll take care of it. We'll That's donate a, as much as we can. It's an insider tip to everybody right now is always make sure that you tell people it's a great closing line. Take what you want and we'll we'll deal with the rest of it. We'll yeah. take their headache away from them. So because on. it's overwhelming. They don't know yes. what to do with all the furniture. Yeah. They don't want to break their backs loading up dumpsters yeah. and, you know, putting things on Facebook marketplace. And yeah. so so be be the be the aspirin to their headache. Yeah. Um, so we bought this house. They took what they wanted. They left the rest and it was full. It was full of stuff. So this, this house was full of enough stuff that we were going to do an estate sale. But before we did an estate sale, we kind of wanted to rummage through it ourselves and, and see what there was. So we sent our employee over there. She had just started working for we us. Had one, we had one employee. Yep. Our we personal had one assistant. Employee. Yep. Sent her over there and uh, she was kind of going through stuff and getting things organized, for figuring out sister. what she was going to price stuff out with at the estate sale. And she comes to us and says, I found something yeah. and she had found behind the couch. It was a fast food bag wrapped in a fast food bag. So two bags. And it was full of $8,000 in cash in cash. How about that? You remember what she said? She said, she said, I wanted to come to you. Cause I thought maybe, cause she's only been working for us for like two weeks. Yeah. And she said, I thought maybe you were testing, testing. me. And I said, if I was going to test you, it wouldn't have been with eight thousand dollars. I'm going to test you with a hundred dollars to see if you'd steal it from me, not eight thousand yeah. dollars. But she gave, we gave her a finder's fee. We gave her ten yep. percent as a finder's fee. We gave her that, and then we kept the cash. You can keep the cash. Some people say, if you're listening right now or you're watching, you might say to yourself, "But can I keep that cash? Is that mine?" Yes, you get to keep everything in the house, good and bad. Yep. So we've had houses we bought that they didn't tell us there was a buried oil tank under the garage. And we had to deal with that. Right. So you get to keep the good and the bad. And, and you don't get to go back to the seller and say, hey, you didn't disclose this and you knew about it. You owe me. Right. You owe me for this. Right. Like, so if, if something's in the house and they yeah. sold it to you, that's your property now. Yeah. So and then I think I found another few hundred bucks, like in the sock drawer, literally in the sock drawer. You did. And then we sold all the stuff at these days for several thousand dollars, yep. too. Crazy. Just a just crazy time. But but we found the house because someone had passed away. Right. And didn't have any family nearby. And again, we talked we've talked in previous episodes about stacking motivators. This is people that were out of town, so they're remote. So it's it's you know, their destination was not good. They were a long ways away. They were they had a death in the family. They couldn't deal with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. All these D's we talked about. Didn't want to. Didn't want to. Yeah. They were done. They just wanted to sell the house and get their money. So when they just want yep. to sell the house and split it, they don't care. Right. So that's that's how yeah. we bought that house. And in the early days, that is how we bought a lot of our houses. We still do. We still do. We still do. We, you have to be you have to be more competitive now to do it. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned in a previous episode about about lawyers and, and uh, dealing with them. They can steal deals from you. So yeah. go listen to our previous episode if you haven't to learn about what happened to us there. One thing, though, that always worked really well for us when we were dealing with estates in particular, people that had, had inherited the house, especially if they had grown up in the house. We would always offer yes. for them to come in and see the house if they wanted to when it was completed. Yes. And some people wanted to. They wanted to see it brought back to its former glory and, and all the new touches that were added to we it. We call it a private showing. Yeah, a private showing. We gave them a private showing. And then other people wanted to remember it the way it was. Yeah. Um, but that was always a nice thing to offer. Or, or if they wanted to keep something special in the house, like if their dad planted the oak tree in the front yard or if, yeah. you know, somebody built a little picket fence, you know, like we, we would say, you know what, we're going to keep that to honor. Makes you, makes you stand out. Yeah. Makes you stand definitely. out in, in a sea of people that are offering on houses, find a way to stand out by yep. doing things like that. Like saying, we'll invite you back for a private showing if you'd like, or remember we helped one of our students that had the, the woman had. All, all the, the, heights. the heights from the different kids' ages. She had that like on a on a four by four in their kitchen. Yes. On a, on a piece of trim. Piece of trim. Yeah, like like door molding. And we took it off and gave it to her. Yes. So, so yeah, she could so save that. That made that made her like selling to to our students. Yes. Because those little those little things make you stand out from the competition. Yep. So that's take that to heart. So how do you find those people? I have some ideas, I'll tell you. So in the early days, we did a thing called obits. We just, that, that became the slang term we used around our office, if you remember that, yeah. but it's OBIT stands for obituaries. We hired a VA, a VA stands for a virtual assistant. So it's an overseas company that we never actually spoke to, but we did it through email and we paid them, you know, not very much money. They would scrub the paper. That means that they will, when I say scrub, they're going to go through and look at all the details of everything. And every week they look through and see who passed away that week. Then they would cross-reference that with who owned a piece of property online. Then we would send out a letter to them saying, if you want to sell your house, we're happy to, to sell your house. Here was my methodology. 
most people, even through our software and software you buy online now, it has to go through a process of several weeks or months before it hits the software to say, this house, this person passed away. So it takes weeks for that to happen. I wanted to hit them immediately so I was ahead of all the competition. Again, I'm always trying to think ahead, like how can I get ahead of the competition? Right. So we sent out those letters. They did really well for us, but the first round, remember how bad it went? Yeah. Remember why? Because we would send out a letter or sympathy card. a sympathy card saying, we're so sorry for your loss. And people just did I, not respond well to that I at all. I screwed up bad on that. I, that was a horrible experience. After losing my dad six years ago, I get it. Like that would have been, that would have like, been really jerk. bad. To <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, like, like you're, you're, you're horrible. So what we do, so I got, we got enough hate response that we stopped that immediately and went right to, we sent them a, it looks like a general letter that went to all the neighbors, right. you know, to the family. We're, we're the, buying houses in this neighborhood. We're, we're buying house. We're targeting your neighborhood. Yes. If you, if you have, if you happen to have a house for sale, let us know. Or if you know anybody, please let us know. We'll pay a referral fee. Yeah. And that would spark a conversation instead of saying you targeted me. We did target them, but they didn't feel like they were being targeted. Yeah. So I would encourage you if you choose to use that method to do that. But yeah, the sympathy cards was a very bad idea. But again, we've talked a lot in previous episodes about how to network with people that are going to be in front of sellers for their own business. Right. And who would they do for this? So estate sales are a great way to find houses. You know, mm -hmm. you can go on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or, or, you know, wherever people advertise for estate sales. Or if you're driving around your, your area and you see a sign for one, by all means, yeah. stop and talk to them. Because yeah. estate sales, obviously, people are selling the the contents of the house. So they're probably going to be selling the house as they well. They usually will call the estate sale people long before they even call a realtor. Right. Because they want to clean the house out first before they do it. So right. sometimes, you know, again, if you can get there, they say, well, we want, we want to sell all the valuables or things or furniture or China or whatever else people have in their house. And if they want to sell that first, well, then you just tell the estate person, listen, I'll pay you $2,000 if you give me a lead that turns, turns to into a deal. A deal. And again, I say this a lot in other, other podcasts, but if you knew you could make $50,000 or even if you're going to wholesale it, make $20,000, would you spend $2,000 to make 20? All day long. I would hope <laughs> you would because you're an investor. You should be doing that. So that's, that's death. Again, that's, that's something, just remember that never stops happening. So those houses become available every single day in America, every day, multiple a day, because unfortunately not one of us is getting out of here alive. Neither are our parents, neither are nobody. Yeah. So that's, that's when they, and when people pass on, you know, I always find it funny too. I was one of my, one of my best friends, his father just passed away and he said, Glenn, you told me something that really has stuck with me. He said, you, you don't keep a lot of stuff. I said, I don't. I said, I used to be, and I am, I am sentimental. I have, I have a few boxes of things that are sentimental and I keep them, but I know that someday our kids are going to throw them out. They're just going to go in a dumpster. And I know that someday it's not, at some point, at some generation, it's not important anymore. Right. I have stuff from my mom. I don't have stuff from my grandma. Yeah. I don't have stuff from my, I, I do have stuff from my great grandfather from a business he started many years ago um, from the phone company yeah. we owned many years ago, but I never knew him. So I lost that connection along the way. So it's just funny how, yeah. you know, and, and one thing too, how much stuff have we thrown out over the years oh, of family pictures and photo and, albums yeah. and oh man, it breaks your heart, but, but it's not my family. No. I don't know who they are, but I can remember being in those houses and going, should we be throwing this stuff out? Jewelry that we found and yeah. coins and yeah. But we've called the family and said, hey, do you want these? Nope. They're like, no. No interest. They don't want it. They just want to move on. Yep. But it's crazy what, yeah. what, what, what's left behind at those yeah. houses. But they, again, they're just done. So yeah. All right. Next is divorce. Divorce. Yeah. We talked in the last episode about um, uh, the guy that in New York that just wanted to move to Florida. This is a, that was a stacking motivator yeah, yeah. because so, he was going through a divorce. Let me define stack. If you haven't, if you haven't heard in this episode, I don't know if we covered it yet in this episode or not, but it's when you have multiple motivators that make somebody extra motivated. So right. if they, if they share, if they, someone died in the family and there was a divorce for that and they were delinquent on their bills and they have, you know, the house is dilapidated. There's multiple The more factors. motivators someone has, the, the more better, motivated they are to The better sell. deal you're going to get. Yeah. So, yeah. So, go ahead. And then our own house here in Florida. That mm -hmm. house only went for sale because the couple was going through a divorce. Should we tell them why they were going through a divorce? <laughs> I think you want to. Well, I, it was during COVID. And apparently, the guy that lived in the house was banging the nanny or the au pair. The au pair, yeah. Au pair. She lived there. She lived yes. in the house. Lived in the house. Like, like he thought he'd get away with that. But then they went through, they were going through divorce and we heard that we were negotiating. We actually, right. this is, this is in January of 21. Yep. 
the prices were just starting to spike down here. They were going up during COVID, but not crazy yet. We literally caught it two like weeks two before, weeks before, it, before it went, went crazy, up. yeah. And it was really perfect timing on our part, and it was it was lucky. Yeah. We weren't we were just looking to move to Florida, but we negotiated in that house, and we offered like six hundred thousand less than they were asking. I don't know about eight hundred thousand less than they were asking. And our real real estate agent said, "You can't do that, not in this market." We're, like, I we're said, investors. I said, we have to. <laughs> I'm an investor, baby. I have to go low. I have to. And they, she said, "Well, you might lose it." I said, "I don't care." I said, I also know they're going through a divorce. And I remember when we walked through the house, we could tell there was tension. Yeah, there was. You could tell there was, like, he wasn't here, but she didn't speak highly of him. And you could right. tell there was. It th was awkward. It was a bad yeah. time. You could tell. And so we knew they were motivated. And not that we're ever happy that somebody's going through a divorce. No, but, no. But, but that's, again, in life, yeah. it happens. So. I mean, he chose to bang the nanny and away we go. Right. So I'm sure we had other problems. But besides that. That negotiating saved us three hundred thousand dollars on right. our on our offer. We got three hundred thousand dollars off on the on the offer, so we right. we did really well with that. So yeah, so, so there, there's obviously lists for people that are going through a divorce. You can certainly network with divorce divorce attorneys. Yes, um, that was a big one too. Yeah, yeah. If you for a while in New York, we were sending. I'm not sure if we still do, but we were sending out letters to divorce lawyers saying we are in the business of buying houses for cash. If you have clients who want to get out. Fast. Fast and not have to see each other and not have to sign stuff together and just want to move on. Let us know. Yeah. And that's a great way to find people that, again, they'll know about deals long before, long before the newspapers will, the attorneys will. And I'm just going to encourage people too to like always be in the win-win mindset. You know, mm -hmm. don't take advantage of people. Always try to get the best deal you can, of, of course. course. Um, but find, you know, be, be the solution for people, whether that's the attorneys so that you're making it easy for their clients or whether it's the sellers themselves, like just try to find win-wins. Last but not least, we've covered a lot here. We've covered a whole bunch of D's in the last several, several episodes. So that the final one is going to be what? Delinquency. You know, there's people that fall yeah. behind in either their taxes or their, their mortgage payments. And once they start getting delinquent, they have a real hard time climbing out of that. So those are do. definitely very motivated sellers. They do. And there's things that can, a lot of things that can be delinquent on too, right? They can, they can be delinquent on their mortgage payment. They can be delinquent on taxes. Thank you again for repeating what I just said. Did you just say that? I literally just said that. So I was actually reading my notes while you were talking. <laughs> so I actually wasn't listening to you. So what did you say, dear? <laughs> that's, yes. that's shocking. That's yes, never dear. happened before ever. I'm sorry. Yes, dear. I did, not, I did not mean to do that. So, well, they, you go on. Continue on then. I'm not going to help you. Now you're on your own. Finish up, my dear. Go ahead. So, yeah, pe people fall behind on those. I said it's very hard to climb out from under that situation. So they're often very motivated sellers. Yep. And they might, they they might typically, have lawsuits. They might. They might and, have and then they, have le they start liens. probably getting liens on their houses. And the people are usually in those situations because they don't make fast decisions. That's very true. So that, that can be a little bit of a complication because they, they don't want to sell. And oftentimes they can be very disgruntled about it. Yeah. So you have to kind of deal with that emotional aspect of it. And, and really through all of these different D's that we're talking about, a lot of these people aren't in happy places. They're so, not. So, you know, so, some more than others. Yeah. And if somebody's falling behind, you know, sometimes that's through just bad choices of their, of their own making. Yep. And sometimes it's because of circumstances that have happened in their life that, yep. that are really no fault of their own. Yeah. So it's really good that whoever you're talking to, that you're, you're sympathetic to their or empathetic to their plight at, at where they are in life and try to help them get out of that situation. Our team now, you know, we, we were always the therapist for a while. Now our team is the therapist, right? Mm -hmm. They're dealing with people, like you said, that are going through tough times. And so we're always trying to figure out how we can, what I mean is every situation every day is different. They're in a good mood one day, they're in a bad mood one day. They think it's a great decision. They think it's a bad decision. They're crazy. They don't show up. Like you said before, they, they're, they don't make the best decisions because that's yeah. why they're in this position in the first right. place. So your job with any level of motivated seller is to get them through that whole process. And so kind of hold, hold their hand through it and really kind of walk them through it step by step and yes. make sure they feel good about it. Before you ventured on the road of being a real estate investor, really get into it, understand that you've got to help people through their problems all the way through. Right. And the deal ain't over until it's over. Right. Till the check is cashed in your bank account, it ain't over. Right. Because everybody says, well, we're closing tomorrow. 
Come when you're officially closed. Yeah. Because a lot of stuff could happen at the closing well, table. Well, that more so happens in, in uh, attorney states than it does title states, but yes. Yeah, maybe so. I guess I don't have a lot of experience in title states because yeah. we do we do the other way, but people still want things and stuff happens at title. We had a hard time. We we were, yeah. bought, we bought the hundred title but, state yeah, that it was a very hard different time. scenario. But yes. so yeah. So here's some takeaways from the motivated seller series that we just went over again. If you have not listened, there's been there's been four episodes. This is the fourth of four episodes that has uh, all the the motivated uh, the the top D's. We've covered death and disease and divorce and dilapidated and destination and downsides, disgusted, disaster, delinquency, deserted. We've covered all those in great detail and sh- shared stories with you and all that. And just remember a few things, right? The motivated sellers are timeless. Yep. We've mentioned this several times. No matter what is going on, there's always motivated. So I don't care what kind of fancy schmancy no. software you have. I don't care what kind of special marketing tools you have that you're unique. Or people online going, my way will get it done for you. If you focus this on- This is the, the secret. This, this is the new way to do it. Yeah, this is the secret. This is the only way to do it. Yeah, whatever. They're just trying to sell you something. You want to focus on those motivated sellers, yeah, right? And, and these sellers exist in every market cycle, whether it's a buyer's market, a seller's market, high interest, low interest, regardless, they exist in every market cycle and in every market, no matter where you are in the country. People are always dying. People have disease. People have divorce. People Everything. have dilapidated. They're delinquent. It's, this happens over and over and over again. We've talked a lot about stacking motivators. And again, the more reasons that someone has to sell that makes them motivated, the more motivated they are. Right. If someone has one reason, like, okay, I'm behind on a bill two months, that's okay. Yeah. But if they're behind on a bill and the house needs repair and it's dilapidated and they don't live in the house anymore because it's an old house that they had to move out of and they can't sell it. Right. You know, so there's a lot of motivating factors and they were downsizing their job and they just went through a divorce. And the more of these D's that are put together, the deeper discount you'll get. Right. Another D, the yep. deeper discount you're going to get <laughs> on that house. So, and then there's also unique ways to find them. And there's very general ways to find them. The more general a way is that you're probably going to have more competition because it's the easier method, the more unique and kind of honed in you can get on, on the deals that are harder to find, you're going to have less competition. Just like, just like our, uh, uh, droning for dollars. That That was a good one we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, We talked about droning for dollars. That's, that's a, that's another good one in the other, other episode we talked about. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I had a good thought. I was going to say, what were you just? What was your last sentence before the uh, droning? The droning threw finding, me off. Finding unique ways, and then there's general. Oh, finding unique ways. ways. And so keep in mind too, when you're doing this, you seriously as a Gen Xer to pad your retirement and to really bring in an extra six figures this year, you're talking about doing two deals a year, two deals. Right. So you have to find two. You don't have to find you know ten a month like we do. Yeah, you don't have to build a monster business no, to do well. You no. can you can build a very small you know very steady consistent Alongside business. Alongside your job, yeah. On the side, side yes. hustle. And so it, the more niche you get, if you say, Glenn, I'm going to focus on people going through divorce and that's you just work with divorce lawyers and you get one good referral source or you find one good referral source from a, a remediation <clears throat> company or right. whatever it might be, you find one good referral source will cost you nothing in marketing. Right. You could easily do a couple deals a year and in five years time, you'll have enough real estate accumulated if you use our method to be worth millions of dollars a few years from right. now. Right. So just just get focused. I love what you said about kind of just focusing on a couple niche niche areas and just drilling down on that. So yeah, and then networking is always going to be your best ROI, your return on your investment. It, right. The more people you know and you get the word out. I mean, heck, even even something as simple as putting on your Facebook page, "Hey, I'm I'm looking for houses to buy. I want to get into real estate investing. Do you know any in your neighborhood?" I mean, some of our students have done that, and I was surprised at how many responses they got yes. from that. Hey, I know one. Hey, I know one. I mean, just network and get the word out there, whether it's putting your your um, card on a bulletin board at a coffee shop or networking with the the agents that we've been talking about and the attorneys and and um, the remediators, like get the word out. You gotta, you gotta let people know what you do. You gotta be your, your own best marketer for sure. And last but not least is we get asked this a lot when we walk off stage or we're doing a podcast, we get emails. Hey, so I know what you said on your podcast, but what's, what's really the, what's secret? the real secret? What's the real secret? How did you find that deal that you made $150,000 on Glenn? How, how did you find, how'd you find that house that, that you really, you bought it and sold it and made a hundred grand, never touched it. How did you do that? And I always say this, I always say, are, were you in the game? Were you looking? Well, no. I wasn't looking. Well, then you never would have found it. Would right. you? You got to get in the game. If you are a Gen Xer like us and you want to get in the game, 
If you want to follow us, by all means, follow us, like learn about us, come to one of our, our workshops, um, just spend time, let us help you, but you got to be in the game. If you're not in the game, you will never find those deals. You'll never have a success you hear about. At some point, you have to stop listening and get in the game. You can't make the game winning shot from the bench. Yeah. Wayne Gretzky, you miss every shot you don't take. And you got You can't win the lottery if you don't play. And you got to be in the game. <laughs> yeah. And the cool part is nobody puts you in this game. There's no coach to put you in. You put yourself right. in the game. So I hope you found this series very valuable and you enjoyed all the different ways we talked about it. We have a lot more knowledge to give you over 20 plus years of investing and 35 years of being a business owner here. So we hope you enjoyed it. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked it, make sure you click like and make sure you don't miss out on any future content because we have a lot more valuable information to cover. So make sure you subscribe and click the notification button so you don't miss anything coming up.